Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing. Today we're going to be continuing to read The Sleeper Awakes. So let's get going. Get on this, cried Graham's conductor, and thrust him forward to a long grating of snowless metal that ran like a band between two slightly sloping expanses of snow. It felt warm to Graham's benumbed feet and a faint eddy of steam rose from it. Come on, shouted his guide ten yards off, and without waiting, ran swiftly through the incandescent glare towards the iron supports of the next range of wind wheels. Graham, recovering from his astonishment, followed as fast, convinced of his imminent capture. In a score of seconds they were within a tracery of glare and black shadows shot with moving bars beneath the monstrous wheels. Graham's conductor ran on for some time, and suddenly darted sideways and vanished into a black shadow in the corner of the foot of a huge support. In another moment Graham was beside him. They cowered, panting, and stared out. The scene upon which Graham looked was very wild and strange. The snow had now almost ceased. Only a belated flake passed now and again across the picture but the broad stretch of level before them was a ghastly white, broken only by gigantic masses and moving shapes, and lengthy strips of impenetrable darkness. Vast, ungainly titans of shadow. All about them huge metallic structures, iron girders inhumanly vast as it seemed to him, interlaced and the edges of wind wheels scarcely moving in the lull passed in great shining curves, steeper and steeper up into a luminous haze. Wherever the snow-spangled light struck down, beams and girders and in incessant bands running with a halting indomitable resolution passed upward and downward into the black. And with all that mighty activity, with an omnipresent sense of motive and design, this snow-clad desolation of mechanism seemed void of all human presence save themselves, seemed as trackless and deserted and unfrequented by men as some inaccessible alpine snowfield. They will be chasing us, cried the leader. We are scarcely halfway there yet. Cold as it is, we must hide here for a space, at least until it snows more thickly again. His teeth chattered in his head. Where are the markets? asked Graham staring out. Where are the people? The other made no answer. Look, whispered Graham, crouched close and became very still. The snow had suddenly become thick again, and sliding with the whirling eddies out of the black pit of the sky came something vague and large and very swift. It came down in a steep curve and swept round, wide wings extended and a trail of white condensing steam behind it rose with an easy swiftness and went gliding up the air, swept horizontally forward in a wide curve, and vanished again in, a, in the steaming specks of snow. And through the ribs of its body, Graham saw two little men, very minute and active, searching the snowy areas about him, as it seemed to him, with field glasses. For a second they were clear, then hazy through the thick whirl of snow, then small and distant, and in a minute they were gone. Now, cried his companion, come. He pulled Graham's sleeve and incontinently the two were running headlong down the arcade of ironwork beneath the wind wheels. Graham running blindly, collided with his leader who had turned back on him suddenly. He found himself within a dozen yards of a black chasm. It extended as far as he could see right and left. It seemed to cut off their progress in either direction. Do as I do, whispered his guide. He lay down and crawled to the edge, thrust his head over, and twisted until one leg hung. He seemed to feel for something with his foot, found it, and went sliding over the edge into the gulf. His head reappeared. It is a ledge, he whispered, in the dark all the way along. Do as I did. Graham hesitated, went down upon all fours, crawled to the edge, and peered into a velvety blackness. For a sickly moment he had courage neither to go on nor retreat. Then he sat and hung his leg down, felt his guide's hands pulling at him, had a horrible sensation of sliding over the edge into the unfathomable, splashed, and felt himself in, the, in a slushy gutter, 
impenetrable, impenetrably dark. This way, whispered the voice, and he began crawling along the gutter through the trickling thaw, pressing himself against the wall. They continued along it for some minutes. He seemed to pass through a hundred stages of misery, to pass m minute after minute through a hundred degrees of cold, damp and exhaustion. In a little while he ceased to feel his hands and feet. The gutter sloped downwards. He observed that they were now many feet below the edge of the buildings. Rows of spectral white shapes like, go like the ghosts of blind-drawn windows rose above them. They came to the end of a cable fastened above one of these white windows, dimly visible and dropping into impenetrable shadows. Suddenly, his hand came against his guides. Still, whispered the latter very softly. He looked up with a start and saw the huge wings of the flying machine gliding slowly and noiselessly overhead, athwart the broad band of snow, uh, snow-flecked grey-blue sky. In a moment it was hidden again. Keep still, they were just turning. For a while both were motionless. Then Graham's companion stood up, and reaching towards the fastenings of the cable, fumbled with some indistinct tackle. What is that? asked Graham. The only answer was a faint cry. The man crouched most motionless. Graham peered and saw his face dimly. He was staring down the long ribbon of sky and Graham, following his eyes, saw the flying machine small and faint and remote. Then he saw that the wings spread on either side, the, that it headed towards them, that every moment it grew larger. It was following the edge of the chasm towards them. The man's mo movements became convulsive. He thrust two crossbars into Graham's hand. Graham could not see them. He ascertained their form by feeling. They were slung by thin, thin cords to the cable. On the cord were hand grips of some soft elastic substance. Put the cross between your legs, whispered the guide hysterically, and grip the holdfasts. Grip tightly. Grip. Graham did as he was told. Jump, said the voice. In heaven's name, jump. For one momentous second, Graham could not speak. He was glad afterwards that the darkness had hid his face. He said nothing. He began to tremble violently. He looked sideways at the swift shadow that swallowed up the sky as it rushed upon him. Jump! Jump in God's name, or they will have us, cried Graham's guide, and in the violence of his passion thrust him forward. Graham tottered convulsively, gave a sobbing cry, a cry in spite of himself, and then, as the flying machine swept over them, fell forward into the pit of that darkness seated on the cross wood and holding the ropes with the clutch of death. Something cracked, something rapped smartly against a wall. He heard the pulley of the cradle hum on its rope. He heard the aeronaut shout. He felt a pair of knees digging into his back. He was sweeping headlong through the air, falling through the air. All his strength was in his hands. He would have screamed, but he had no breath. He shot into a blinding light that made him grip the tighter. He recognised the great passage with the running ways, the hanging lights and interlacing girders. They rushed upward and by him. He had a momentary impression of a great round mouth yawning to swallow him up. He was in the dark again, falling, falling, gripping with aching hands, and behold, a clap of sound, a burst of light, and he was in a brightly lit hall with a roaring multitude of people beneath his feet. The people, his people, a proscenium, a stage rushed up towards him, and his cable swept down to a circular aperture to the right of this. He felt he was travelling slower, and suddenly very much slower. He distinguished shouts of, Saved! The Master! He is safe! The stage rushed up towards him with rapidly diminishing swiftness. Then, he heard, a ma heard the man clinging behind him shout as if, he s as if suddenly terrified, and this shout was echoed by a shout from below. He felt that he was no longer gliding along the cable, but falling with it. There was a tumult of yells, screams, and cries. He felt something soft against his extended hand, and the impact of a broken fall quivering through his arm. He wanted to be still, 
and the people were lifting him. He believed afterwards he was carried to the platform and given some drink, but he was never sure. He did not notice what became of his guide. When his mind was clear again, he was on his feet. Eager hands were assisting him to stand. He was in a big alcove, occupying the position that in his previous experience had been devoted to the lower boxes, if this was indeed a theatre. And with that, we come to the end of the episode. So I will say thank you very much for joining us today. I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night. No matter what time of day it is, I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.